Alright, what I want to do is, uh, you know, is I got bored out tonight because I want to explain to you some stuff that I had mentioned last week in more detail because you have to understand it before we go through the rest of the book. So, let's look at chapter 12, do a quick review. Uh, and the question Chris brought up last week kind of spurred me on to look at chapter, the first <coughs> chapter 12 a little more closely because he mentioned the part about Jesus being uh, called up to the throne room of God. He mentioned the chronological part about that. And um, so I'll, I checked into all that. But let's look in uh, chapter 12 and I'll tell you what I thought of it. Instead, uh, we talked about a great sign in heaven. The woman we identified as Israel. The uh, man child was uh, Jesus himself. Uh, we got the red dragon here in this part. We identified that red dragon as Satan because it actually tells us so over verse 9. It says the great dragon who, well, uh, who was hurled down to earth, that ancient serpent, called the devil or Satan. So we know that the dragon is Satan. So we got these three characters, uh, Israel, the nation Israel. We got uh, the man-child Jesus who was who come out of the nation, nation Israel, who come out of the tribe of Judah, and we got this uh, devil himself. And we see here a picture of the devil trying his best to eat up the man child, or to do away with the man child. And also, we see a picture of the man child, Jesus, being called up to the throne room of God in chapter 5. I mean, verse 5 says she gave birth to a son, a male child who ruled the nation for the nine scepter. Uh, that's uh, found in, uh, actually it was in the second chapter of Revelation and also back in Psalms chapter 2. And it says her child was snatched up to God and to his throne room. And that's what spurred this question on about the chronological order of Jesus being resurrected. Because the snatching up to God and to the throne room is actually the resurrection of Jesus Christ. But we find it placed here in between the, se uh, the seventh trumpet and the first bowl judgment. It's fixing to come up in the next uh, chapter or two. Why is, it in, why is it right here? That's the big question. What is this picture of Israel... <coughs> Uh, Jesus and the devil trying his best to do away with Israel and Jesus placed right here. Well, what I found out, Chris, is this is placed here because we've been looking at a lot of bad stuff. We've been looking at a lot of bad judgments and we're fixing to look at a lot of more bad judgments. And it's placed here to give us a fresh breath of air. This is not actually Jesus being carried up to the throne room of God in the middle of the seven year tribulation is a picture of him being spiritually protected. The devil can't get to Jesus. He's spiritually protected. And that's what it's saying here. We don't have to worry about Jesus getting defeated by the Satan because he's spiritually protected. Also found two verses that support what I'm telling you. First one is in John uh, John chapter 14 verse 30 we're going to look at both of them right quick John chapter 14 verse 30 says this is Jesus talking I will say much more to you but the prince of this world is coming we know who the prince of the world is at this time it's Satan himself listen to this part he has no hold over me he has no hold over me. Then you go over to John chapter 19, verse 11, and we find Pilate here having a discussion with Jesus. And Jesus, um, Pilate said, he says, Do you refuse to speak to me? Pilate said, Don't you realize I have power either to free you or to crucify you? You know what Jesus said? He answered. You have no power over me if it were not given to you from above. So what this, this little passage is placed here for 
is just to kind of take our mind off of all the judges that's been going on and to give us that fresh breath of air, knowing that there's no way Satan will ever defeat <coughs> Jesus or the nation Israel. He will wreak havoc on the nation Israel, but in the end, the nation Israel will be protected and they will be saved. Paul even talks about that great mystery over in Romans where he says, uh, I tell you a great mystery, all of Israel will be saved. And we don't know what that mystery is, and we don't know exactly how it's going to happen, but it will happen. So that's why we get this here. Then we see, um, we see uh, the war in heaven breaking out. In, in verse 7, where Michael fought against the dragon, and the dragon uh, and his angels fought back, but he was not strong enough, and they lost their place in heaven. And we got to wonder, what in the world is this fight going on in heaven way back here in, uh, in the New Testament? We see this fight going on in heaven during the seven-year tribulation, and we know Satan got kicked out of heaven long, long years ago. You know, Isaiah 14, uh, Laurel mentioned that, when Satan got kicked out of heaven for trying to be like God, for wanting to be like God. But we also studied Scripture and found out that even though Satan had been kicked out of heaven, his name was Lucifer as a perfect angel in heaven. And I went over that with you last week in Ezekiel 28 where it describes Satan as being this, this marvelous uh, cherub and angel, just the best of the best, the most beautiful angel God created. But also, we look over at Job chapter 1. This is just one of the verses that shows that Satan still had access to heaven. In Job chapter 1, and we know this because of this passage and also because what he's called here in this passage. Listen closely. One day the angels came to present themselves before the Lord and Satan also came with them. The Lord said to Satan, Where have you come from? Now, we know before Satan got kicked out of heaven, he was in heaven. He was a chair of angel, he was the highest of the highest angels. So right here we see him coming from where? Satan answered the Lord from roaming throughout the earth and going back and forth on that. So we see him here called Satan. Before his name was Lucifer, and if you look back at chapter at verse nine of chapter twelve in Revelation, that great dragon who was hurled down to earth, that ancient serpent called the devil or Satan. So there's the proof. One of the verses out of three I found in the Bible that Satan still had access to the throne room of heaven. It says over here in verse ten. He was the accuser of our brothers and sisters. In other words, Satan constantly roaming throughout the earth would go to, up to the throne room of God and accuse us night and day. He would go up there and say something like, Randy is saved, but did you hear that line he told the church tonight about cooking that spaghetti? <laughs> That's Satan right there. Going to, he's an accuser. Trying to do anything to cut our throat. And God had given him that access to the throne room of heaven. And he even let Satan uh, just do a lot to Job. If y'all if y'all ever get a chance, study the book of Job. If you ever think you got it bad, things are going bad for you, study the book of Job. Job lost everything. His health, his family, and everything. He never once cursed God. He never gave in. And all, at the end, it was all restored to him. But that's a good book to study. So we see here that uh, Satan did have access to heaven with his crooked angels. They would just go and accuse us day and night. If they see Herbal speeding down the road, he shoots the head. Herbal saved it. Did you see him, how fast he was going on 95 today? Aren't you a Christian? Brothers and sisters, supposed to, aren't your children supposed to obey the law? You know? Or I don't even say what they don't want to do. <laughs> the main thing is this great war broke out in heaven uh, during the tribulation period here. And 
and Satan lost his place in heaven. He was hurled to earth, never to get to return to heaven again. And it says down here in verse 12, But woe to the earth and to the sea, because the devil has gone down to you. He is filled with fury, because he knows that his time is short. So we're talking about the last three and a half years of the tribulation, when all this takes place. Uh, Satan has lost his ability to even go to heaven and accuse us anymore. So he comes to the earth and he takes his fury out of those who were left on the earth at the time. So that kind of wraps up chapter 12. And then I got into chapter 13 last night, I mean last week, and I told you that I promised you I'll help you understand the beginning of chapter 13 a little better. Because I started rambling off about these ten pigs, the ten toes of Nebuchadnezzar's uh, statue, the ten horns, all kind of stuff I started talking about. A revived Roman Empire, and you got no clue, most of you, what I was talking about. So tonight I'm going to simplify this because it's important, it's crucially important you understand what these ten toes of Nebuchadnezzar's statue, when you hear me uh, saying stuff like the ten toes or the uh, uh, ten horns or ten kings or a ten nation confederation, you need to know what I'm talking about because we're going to run into that throughout the rest of this book of Revelation. So here is my simplest way to explain it to you. And that's through Scripture, of course. We always let the Bible speak for us. We're going to start with Nebuchadnezzar's dream. Do y'all remember when we studied Daniel in chapter 2? Nebuchadnezzar had this dream about a huge statue with a head of gold and breastplate of silver and the waist was a bronze and the, the belly, belly section was bronze and the waist and the legs were uh, iron. Do y'all remember that? We talked about it. And we ended up talking about the ten toes. Let's go to cha Daniel chapter 2. <coughs> Follow me in the Bible. And we will look at this and we'll look at this and we'll I'll help y'all understand what I'm talking about here. Did you say Daniel? Daniel chapter 2. Chapter 2 of Daniel. Nebuchadnezzar had this dream about this statue, and my lovely wife drew this statue for us. And he had a dream about this head of gold, and I explained to you on down. And here in chapter 2, we find Daniel uh, telling you what the dream meant. Remember, Daniel, uh, Nebuchadnezzar tried to get his astrologers and magicians to tell him what the dream meant. None of them could do it. He, had, he wanted them all put to death, and they found that Daniel was presented to him, and Daniel said, the Lord, my Lord, my God, can uh, reveal this dream to you. Anyway, he went on to tell Nebuchadnezzar that the head of gold represented him. It represented the Babylonian Empire. Uh, very powerful, rich. Gold is a rich substance. Uh, very rich, very powerful. But he also went on to tell him that there would be another kingdom after him, but it would be inferior to his. In other words, his kingdom would get uh, captured. We know how this happened. Remember the Medes and the Persians, the Medo-Persian Empire? They slipped up under the uh, wall, the Euphrates River. They dried the riverbed up. And they slipped up on under the wall. They were all, the uh, Babylonians were inside just having a party because they thought they were invincible. Remember, they had enough supplies inside of the Babylonian city to last 20 years without ever having to leave. They had fresh water supply, they had food stocked everywhere. They could have lived 20 years inside the city and never have to leave outside the wall. Anyway, they thought they could not be captured. And the means that the Persians come up with this idea to drop the Euphrates and split their soldiers up under the wall, and they did just that one night while the Babylonian uh, rulers were drunk. They went in and captured the city. 
That's the breastplate of silver. Uh, the silver is a little less valuable, but it's also stronger than the gold, right? The metal silver is stronger than the gold. So less, less inferior kingdom, but a little bit stronger. Okay, they ruled for quite a while, and then next thing we know, we have the uh, breastplate of uh, the chest, middle, middle section, stomach of uh, bronze, which is the Grecian Empire, run by Alexander the Great. Y'all remember Alexander the Great? You studied him in school. He captured the whole known world by the age of 30 years old. He one night went and got on his knees and he wept and he cried. And he was asked, why are you crying? He said, because there's nothing left to capture. He got drunk, caught pneumonia, and he died. That <clears throat> empire ended up getting captured by the, the, uh, by the Romans. They were the midsection here of iron, real strong, real strong, less uh, light, less ornate or less valuable, but a stronger, stronger empire. The midsection of Rome. And I'm getting down to the ten toes. I'm, I, you need to understand how this flow works. All right. Rome was in charge over Israel. They had Israel captive during the time of Jesus. Y'all all remember that. Anyway, we got Rome splitting east and west here in the legs. Now, I, I jotted this down because I, yeah, I keep from having to walk up here in my notes. At 476 AD, which was a long time after Jesus' ascension into heaven, Rome fizzled out and uh, just disintegrated. was not a nation anymore. That puts us at the end of the prophecy right here. The east and west, the world split up, they fizzled out down here in the feet area. <clears throat> then you got the ten toes. Now this is where we're going to get into the ten toes. Daniel chapter 2, 40, uh, verses 42 and 44 says this. As the toes were partly iron and partly clay, so this kingdom will be partly strong and partly brittle. Just as you saw the iron mixed with baked clay, so the people will be a mixture and will not remain united anymore than the iron mixes with the clay. In the time of those kings, it talks about the toes and it goes to say, it replaces the word toes with kings. In the time of those kings, the God of heaven will set up a kingdom that will never be destroyed. In other words, here's what happens. Sometime in our future, the glory of the Roman Empire will be brought back up. It'll be called a revived Roman Empire. It hasn't happened yet, and we're going to get into it, we're going to look at it, but it's going to be a revived Roman Empire that is, that is brought up by the Antichrist himself. It will be a ten-nation confederation, basically. In other words, from what I've studied and what I've come up with and what most scholars say, at the time of the end toward the end of the tribulation period, the globe itself will be split up into ten separate empires. There will be ten empires throughout the whole globe. This is the vision of the ten toes. This is where the ten kings come in. And if you go down a little further in uh, Daniel's interpretation of the dream, it talks about a rock that was cut out of a mountain, but not by human hands, that rolled down the mountain and crushed the ten toes. In other words, that's the verse I just read to you. In the time of those kings, the God of heaven will set up a kingdom that will never be destroyed. At the end of the seven year tribulation, we know that Jesus comes back, we have the battle of Armageddon, and the rule uh, the empire rule of man is over. Jesus sets up his thousand year reign on earth and we're going to get into that further into Revelation. But anytime you hear me talk about ten toes, ten kings, uh, uh, ten horns, or a ten nation confederation, you know that's what I'm talking about. 
It was prophesied way, way back in the book of Daniel it was talked about. Uh, now it's talked about in the book of Revelation. It will happen. You can trust that. It will happen. It's God's word. This is what happens toward the end of the uh, tribulation. There will be a ten nation confederation with the Antichrist ruling over all of them. Now, if you jump over here to Daniel chapter 7, just a few pages over, we're going to talk about what, what I just talked about. We're going to look at Scripture. It's going to explain to you what I just talked about. Let's look down, let's say, I'm going to go ahead and read most of this because it's important that you understand this. We might not get too far behind our calendar to understand it. I'm going to start in verse 2. Verse 2. Daniel said, In my vision at night I looked, and before me were four winds of heaven churning up the great sea. Four great beasts, each different from the others, came out of the sea. The four great beasts are the ones we just talked about, the four empires from the Babylonian down to Rome. <clears throat> the first was like a lion, Babylonians, with, with wings of an eagle. I watched until its wings were torn off and it was lifted from the ground. It stood on two feet with, like a human being, and, uh, and the mind of the human was given to it. And there before me was a second piece. It looked like a bear, that's to be no Persians. It was raised up on one side, with the, uh, had three ribs in its mouth between its teeth. It was told to uh, uh, get up and eat your pills of flesh because uh, the meats were actually stronger than the Persians, so that's where we get that part. After that, I looked, there before me was another beast, one that looked like a leopard, and on its back had four wings of those of a bird. The four wings speaks of the swiftness of Alexander the Great conquering the known world. This beast had four heads and was given authority to rule. Remember when Alexander the Great died, he turned over his kingdom to his four generals. That's where the four heads are talking about right here. After that, in my vision, and I looked before me, was a fourth beast. Now this is the, this is the empire of Rome that, that uh, Daniel is foreseeing in the future. And we can look back and see it. So after that, in my vision, I looked not there was before me a fourth beast, terrifying and frightening and very powerful. It had large iron teeth. It crushed and devoured its victims. Victims that trampled around the foot, whatever was left. It was different from the, all the former beasts, and it had ten horns. But there we get the Roman Empire. Remember last week, in so many words, I kept trying to tell you that he couldn't even describe his empire as that of an animal. It was so vicious and cruel. He could not think of an animal like he did with the first three. But it says, right here it talks about that this fourth beast had ten horns. This is where the Roman Empire fizzles out and we get the ten nation confederation. It's actually going to happen in the future from a revived Roman Empire. While I was thinking about the horns, there before me was another horn, a little one. Now this little horn is the Antichrist. This is what Daniel sees him as in his uh, dreams, which came up among them, and three of the first horns were uprooted before it. This horn had, eye, had eyes like the eyes of the human being, and now it's supposed to be. Skip down to... Uh, Verse 15. I came with trouble of spirit, and the visions had passed through my mind. Disturbed me. I approached one of those standing there and asked him the meaning of all this. So he gave me, he told me and gave me the interpretation of these things. The four great beasts are four kings that will rise from the earth. Four kings. Boom, 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 boom. Just like I explained. Uh, but the holy people and the most high will receive the kingdom and possess it forever and ever. Yes, forever and ever. This is when Jesus actually comes back and takes over the world uh, for his thousand of year reign. Then I wanted to know the meaning of the fourth beast. This is the Roman Empire, which was different from all the others and most terrifying with its iron teeth and bronze claws. The beast that crushed and devoured its victims and trampled underfoot what was left. 
also wanted to know about the ten horns on its head and the other horn that came up, which the other three had fell, and the horn looked more imposing than the others, and it had eyes of the mouth that spoke boastfully. That would be the Antichrist. As I watched, this horn was waging war against the holy people and defeating them uh, until the Ancient of Days came and pronounced judgment in favor of the holy people on the most high. And the time came when they possessed the kingdom. He gave me this explanation. The fourth beast is the fourth kingdom that will appear on earth, the Roman Empire. It will be different from all other kings and it will devour the whole earth, trampling it down and crushing it. The ten horns are ten kings who will come from this kingdom. There's scripture to support what I've been telling you. The ten horns are ten kings that will come from the Roman kingdom. Remember, Rome fizzles out. We're living in the time of the Gentiles right now. But the Roman, the glory of the Roman kingdom will be uh, brought back with the Ten Nations Confederation. Y'all ever heard the uh, rhyme Humpty Dumpty set on the wall? Humpty Dumpty had a great fall. All the king's horses and all the king's men couldn't put Humpty together again. Do you know where that rhyme come from? The fall of Rome. It's all about the fall of Rome. All the king's horses and all the king's men couldn't put Humpty together again. After Rome fell and disintegrated, there's been other people who have tried and tried to revive Rome, but they just couldn't do it. Because it's not going to happen until God gets ready for it to happen. So there we go with that. And now turn back to Revelation chapter 17. Chapter 17, we got one more place to show you about the Ten Nations of Federation. Chapter 17, verses 12 and 13. <clears throat> I always want to let Scripture back up what I tell you. Revelation 17, verses 12 and 13. The ten horns you saw are ten kings who have not yet received a kingdom. But for one hour, we receive authority as king along with the beast. Now listen to this part. We're going to look a little further into chapter 13, and it talks about everybody wanting to worship the beast and uh, follow the beast. And now we see here why. They have one purpose and will give their power and authority over to the beast. In other words, these ten nations, these ten empires that will sprout up on earth in the future will give all their power and authority over to the beast. We know the beast is the Antichrist himself. So now, do you understand what the ten horns are? Do you understand what the ten kings are? Hasn't happened yet, but it will happen. I promise you it will happen. Just like all this happened, <clears throat> Daniel prophesied about it. We can look back and see it happened exactly as Daniel had wrote in his book before it ever happened. So we can count on the future world with ten, wrong, ten empires with the Antichrist ruling over all ten. I mentioned several times about three of them being subdued. I didn't ever comment on it. I just meant to do three of them being subdued. Now what's going to happen is these ten empires that will be ruling or with the Antichrist ruling over them, somehow, some way, he seduced three of them that brings it down to seven. What do we know about the number seven? It's a number of what? Completeness. Completeness. I mentioned twice about the Antichrist subduing three of these nations, uh, uh, consolidating them down to seven, a number of completeness. Now, let's look into verse chapter 13. The dragon stood on the shore of the sea. Remember, I told you the sea represents uh, people, nations, languages. Uh, it represents the Gentile nations. And I saw a beast coming out of the sea. The beast being the Antichrist himself, 
we can look at Revelation uh, 13, 18, and it talks about the Antichrist being a man. So we know that, I mean, the beast being a man, so we know it is a person. Therefore, it is the Antichrist himself. It had ten horns and ten seven heads with ten crowns on its horn. The ten horns represent these ten nations, this ten nation confederation. The crowns on their head represents their authority. The seven, uh, the seven heads represent the seven empires that ruled and uh, held dominance over Israel while they were a nation. Now, who were they? Who's first? What about Joseph? That story of Joseph. Who, who had him cap captive for 400 years? The Egyptians. Egyptians. The Syrians were next when they come down and conquered the ten northern kingdoms. Then the Babylons that we talked about. The Medo-Persians, the Greeks, Alexander the Great. Rome, that six, and we got one left that will reign and rule over Israel for a while. For only three and a half years, and that is the Ten Nation Confederation. Okay, that makes the seven. That's what these seven heads uh, represent. But it has dual meaning. It also represents the city of seven hills, which is wrong. And what it says, what it's saying here is this dragon, uh, the, the beast I'm talking about, the, the Antichrist, will pretty much have his home base in Rome, the revived Roman Empire, and he will be in charge of these ten nations. And what, what, what uh, point he seduced three of them, we will find out that later. Okay. And it talks about on each head a blasphemous name, but we know at this point he's broken his covenant with Israel and the world, and he's out to get God. He's out to curse God, a blasphemous name. Then I saw, the beast I saw was a representative of a leopard. In other words, it had qualities of the Grecian Empire, but had feet of those of a bear, the qualities of the Medo-Persian. The dragon gave the beast his power, his strong, and his great authority. So this Antichrist will be uh, given power by Satan himself. Remember last week I told you you're going to get introduced to the unholy trinity? The uh, dragon, Satan, the beast, the Antichrist, and another beast, the false prophet. That's the unholy trinity. We're going to study this unholy trinity very closely because it is our enemy, and we need to know all we can about the uh, enemy. This unholy trinity, uh, headed up by Satan, Satan himself tries to be God. He, he uses his uh, antichrist, his beast, as Jesus, and the false prophet it represents the unholy spirit. So it says, I'm going to go a couple more verses and we're going to quit. One of the heads of the beast seemed to have a fatal wound, but the fatal wound had, had been healed. What happened to Jesus on the cross? He what? He died. <clears throat> what happened to him in the grave? He had been healed. See, this unholy trinity tries its best to duplicate, duplicate, duplicate <laughs> everything that the holy trinity does. And it's, it gets interesting. We're going to talk about the mark of the beast next week and all that good stuff. So I'm going to leave it there. I just had to take up more time on this ten toes, ten kingdoms, because you have to know about that before we can get into, in, into this book. Any further. You have to understand that there will be a revived Roman Empire. The blood will be split into ten empires uh, run by Satan and his unholy truth. Father God, we thank you for your word. We thank you that scripture can clarify your word. Uh, just pray for all these people here tonight that you put a blessing upon them, Lord, and taking their time out to come here. And uh, be spiritually fed by the Lord. Now go with us, Father, and use us in a mighty way. We are your children, and we do have a responsibility to fulfill the Great Commission. I 
pray that you put people in front of us that we can witness to, Father, people that are uh, ready to hear your gospel message and be receptive to it. Keep us safe as we leave this place. 